Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Just a quick uh, testimony, I guess. Um, I'm from Philadelphia. I came here uh, through my, my brother in Christ, Robinson, over there, and uh, I've just been blessed. Uh, Robinson has just really welcomed me into his house there and uh, pretty much just gave me like a little section of the house pretty much of my own, and it's just been so awesome, him, him and Blessy and their beautiful, beautiful little girl. Um, it's just been so awesome, and uh, I got to tell you, when I was in Philadelphia and Robinson was a part of our church, like everybody asks about Robinson now, and they ask about where he is and how he's doing, so I'm going to have a great report to bring back, and Robinson was just such an awesome blessing to our church, as I know that he's a blessing to your church, and um, I remember that I was really blown away by Robinson when one day he was like, I need to sit down with you and talk, and then I said, okay, let's sit down and talk. And he sat down with me, and he opened up his laptop, and he had this PowerPoint presentation on, like, the universe. <laughs> and he started talking about this stuff, and I was like, whoa, man. <laughs> I'm, like, studying for my next physical therapy exam, and this guy is, like, dwelling and, like, delving into the universe and, and God's creation and how, how awesome God is. It was then that I realized how methodical and how smart and how intelligent and how much of, a, of an advantage is to have a great guy like that in your church. So that's just another great, great blessing you guys have. Um, as far as me, um, my church is called Pilgrim's Vision International Church. It's in Philadelphia. Uh, my dad's the pastor there, and I do a lot of the youth and the music ministry there, along with my cousin. Um, I was recently married. I was married last year. I got married last year. And um, I'm expecting, we're expecting a baby um, in about a month and a half. So we're just so blessed and so excited and as I look at my life now, and as I look at how far God has brought me, and especially as I was here yesterday and I saw these guys, these kids, um, doing this music and just blowing me away, I thought about what I was like in high school. And I started to think about that last night when I was kind of going over this. And I remember just being like this chubby kid in high school who just had first period lunch, which was the worst lunch, and just sitting there and not being able to do any of these amazing things. But the one thing that I decided to do, because when I was in high school, that's when I first really came in a relationship with the Lord, was I decided one day that I wanted to carry my Bible to school. Because I was too shy to speak, and I was too scared to talk to people. So I thought, if I carried my Bible with me, people might talk to me. So they might ask me, hey, why do you have a Bible? And that would kind of be a conversation starter. So I carried this Bible with me to school every day. And one day I met this kid named Rich. And he was in, I believe he was in my, some sort of art class. And as I was sitting in the back of class, he asked me, he was like, why do you have a Bible? And I was like, oh, very great, here we go. I'm ready. And I said, uh, because I'm a Christian. And he was like, oh, you're a Christian, huh? And uh, he said, um, well, why, does, why does God let bad things happen? And uh, <laughs> all I thought about was carrying the Bible. I didn't really think about anything beyond that. Um, he asked me things like, how can you be free from doing bad things when you're tempted everywhere you look? Oh, man, I had nothing to say. He said, everywhere I look, I see things that tempt me. There's, there's kids in my next class who have drugs. There's girls over here. There's things everywhere that tempt me to do bad things. How do I not do that? How do I stop doing that? And how can you be free from this thing you call sin? And in my, in my theological mind, I said, you just try. <laughs> and that's all I had. Uh, so I told him that, and we kind of chuckled. But it wasn't until later in my life, um, when I did something kind of stupid and goofy, that I kind of realized what the answer to that question, or some of those questions, was. I was in my house, and I was getting dressed, and I did something stupid like I did today. And I, you see this shirt? You see how, yeah. A couple people noticed it this morning. Didn't say anything probably because they were being polite. But um, the first button's off. And so this collar is like way up in the sky. And this collar's all messed up. And I did that. And my wife said, what are you doing? She's like, look at your shirt. And I looked at myself and I noticed that the first button was off. And what I realized is that when the first button was wrong, Everything that followed it was messed up. That if I didn't get the first thing right, that 
no matter what the other ones looked like, it was all screwed up. And that immediately translated into my brain. And I thought about the way we act and where our life truly begins in the spiritual walk, what the first step really is. Because if you don't get the first step right, then it doesn't matter what the rest looks like, because this looks like this. <laughs> Could you all bow your heads with me in a quick word of prayer? Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you so much for this time, my God. Hallelujah, Jesus. If you could all just pray with me and just worship together and just talk to God this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father God, we come to this place not because we want anything from you in the way of money or cars or houses or any of those great things, God. We don't come here in this place for that reason, Father God, but we come in this place this morning to hear from you. We come in this place this morning to touch you, God, to know you, Father. That's why we come in this place, because as that song said this morning, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is higher than any other thing on this earth, Father God. We have lived this life on this earth. We have tried other things. We have gone other places, and we have realized, Father God, without a shadow of a doubt, that we know that our God is greater than any of these other things, Father God. I pray, Lord God, that as I speak this morning, I pray, Lord Jesus, that while I am speaking, Father, that you speak to someone. Lord God, I pray that you use these words that are coming out of my mouth, Father. I am not the most eloquent person in the world. I'm not the greatest person in the world by any stretch of the imagination, Father. But these words, I pray that you take these words, Father God, and you put them in someone's heart, Father God. I pray that they not go in one, one ear and just out the other, never to be seen again, Father. But I pray that these words find a place in a heart, God, and if they find a place in a heart, Father, I know that they will stay there. Lord Jesus, I pray that you take this word and you do something with it, Father. I know that you have given me this word for a purpose. Lord God, I pray that as I leave this place, God, that people not even remember who I am. But I pray that they remember this word. I pray that they forget my name and they forget where I came from and they forget everything else. But I pray that they remember this word. I pray that they remember this word because it's not the word of a man, but it's the word of God. Lord God, I pray that you bless this service, God. And I pray that these ears and these hearts are receptive this morning. I pray that the ears and the hearts in this place, young and old, kid and adult, I pray that they are receptive this morning and not closed off. Father God, I pray that you bless us this morning. Not with anything else but the assurance of your presence in this place with the assurance of our salvation in this place, God. In your precious holy name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you could turn your Bibles with me and just read a few scriptures. Can someone please read for me Mark 12, verse 28 to 31? Mark 12, verse 28 to 31. Beautiful. Can someone please read Matthew 5, verse 8? Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And one more, Proverbs 20, verse 9. Can someone read that, please? Praise God. Now, if we look at the, the second verse that was read, we see, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Then we look at Proverbs 29, the last verse that was read. Who can say that I have a pure heart, one that is free from sin? So you need a pure heart to see God, but who can say that they have a pure heart, only one who is free from sin? Sounds kind of difficult. So you're telling me that you cannot see God unless you have a pure heart, and you can only have a pure heart if you're free from sin. Who among us can say that? That we are free from sin. I guess it begins by asking the question, what is sin? What is sin? And as I was taught in Sunday school when I was a little kid is that sin is anything that separates you from God. Sin is anything from, that separates you from God. And what I learned later was that there was two kinds of sin. There were sins of commission and then sins of omission. And I know that Abigail's got a really nice guitar. And I know that if I were to come in the middle of the night and steal that guitar and take it with me back to Philadelphia, 
that would be a sin of commission, right? Because I committed a sin. Now, a sin of omission would be if Nancy came along and stole that guitar, and I saw her steal that guitar and said nothing and did nothing. Sin of omission. Either way, I'm committing a sin. It seems like there's no way to get around it. And people have asked all throughout time and throughout the world, what is it that makes us do the things that we do? Why do we do the things that we do? And people out in the secular world, people like um, Sigmund Freud, a, you know, an analytical person from the past in the world, he says that the reason that we do the things we do is because of how we came through evolution. We evolved this way to do the things that we do. Another intellectual person by the name of Carl Jung says the reason that we do the things we do is because of how we were influenced by our racial history. So us as Indians are inclined to do certain things that other people from a different race might not be inclined to do. We do the things we do because of how we are influenced by our racial history. That's what Carl Jung says. Carl Rogers, a different intellectual, says that we do things because of the environment around us that influences us. So according to that, here in Houston, you guys are influenced to do certain things while I in Philadelphia am influenced to do other things. Or if I went to Australia, they're influenced there to do certain things that I might not be influenced to do while I'm here. That is the reason that we do bad things. That's what these intellectuals have said over time, and there's many, 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 many other theories as to why we do the things we do. Why do we do the bad things that we do? But I have a question. What does God say? What does Jesus say as to why we do the things that we do? Jesus says that it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. So many of these different people say that things are influencing us, from, influencing us from around us, but what Jesus says is that it starts right here. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with vigilance, for from it flows the rivers of life, springs of life. And what Proverbs does in that scripture is that it just paints this beautiful portrait. Now, I am not a painter by any means, and I can't draw. So I went online, and I found this picture, and it says, Heart River. <laughs> And so I found this picture, and I just decided to uh, bring it in. Because when I looked at this picture, it kind of painted a portrait for me as to what Proverbs was saying. Now, if you look at this picture, and we, we take a look at it, you see that this river is coming from this heart, right? Exactly. So if I were to go into this river and down here pluck out a piece of trash or something like that, am I really solving the problem? Am I really solving the problem? Well, okay, I'll go back and I'll, I'll take out a, a soda can or I'll take out, you know, whatever's in there. Am I really solving the problem? Not really. Because from the heart flows the rivers of life. I'm not addressing the problem. I'm only addressing the effects of it. Amen? Does that make sense? So in my life, I've met a lot of people I've met a lot of different people who have come up to me and said a lot of different things as far as what they are dealing with. And you know, the, the Bible, Proverbs and the Bible, the rest of the Bible mentions the heart over 900 times. Now, if the Bible mentions something that many times, you would be inclined to believe that it's a pretty important thing. Amen? So I've met a lot of people and, and, and people tend to come up to me and they say, Sean, I have a lust problem. I have a lust problem. You see, I, I see a girl who walks by and then I think something and then it's stuck in my head and I think all kinds of bad things. I've met people in my life who say, I have a real bad lust problem because I go to these certain places and do these certain things that I'm not supposed to do. I look at things that I'm not supposed to look at. Matthew 5, 28 says what? If you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Amen? Amen? You don't have a lust problem. You have a heart problem. You see, lust is just the manifestation of what's going on, what's coming from your heart. Whatever's going on in your heart is projecting out as lust. 
I've had different people come up to me and they've said, you know what, I have a financial problem, a spending problem. I like to gamble. I like to put my money into things that I shouldn't put my money into. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart is. My contention is you don't have a spending problem. You don't have a gambling problem. What you do is you do have a heart problem. Because of what's going on in your heart, it's manifesting itself out as a spending problem, a gambling problem. And this is one that I hear a lot, a whole lot. I have an anger problem. Can some of us relate to that? I have an anger problem. I remember when I was little, I had a little temper problem. I don't know if any of you want to admit that. But I, I, I had an anger problem when I was younger, when I was really small. And they say, you know what? I, I have an anger problem. I curse. I say bad things. I, I, I just I flip off and I just do crazy things all, uh, just because anything might just tick me off. I have an anger problem. The Bible says from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we look at this picture again, from that river, from that heart going into that river, the, whatever is going on in the heart manifests itself out in this scenario as anger, as rage, as bitterness, as cursing, as all those type of things. The cursing and the anger isn't the problem. It's what's going on in the heart. Does that make sense? If we can look on into another scripture here, Mark 7, verses 20 to 23. Mark 7, verses 20 to 23. If someone could read that, please. Amen. You see, a lot of religious people, a lot of religious folks like to think that if they just stay away from all these things, they'll be okay. They think if they stay away from these certain people or if they stay away from this certain culture or these certain groups of scenarios and situations, that they'll be fine. But what we don't realize sometimes is that the problem isn't outside. The problem is right here. The problem is right here. You can hide inside church, you can hide inside your house, you can hide inside your closet, you can hide away from the world, you can say, I'll never talk to this certain group of people and I'll never associate with this type of people, but you can't escape from this, your heart. We are born this way, amen? We are born this way. And, and what I've seen over time is that people have tried different things to kind of stop doing these bad certain habits in their life. And it never really works, does it? There's self-help books and there's all types of things. You can look left and right and there's something to always help you. And I remember that I had a friend who would always curse. Like that was his thing. Like in high school, he would just consistently say the F word over and over again. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get him to stop. It was just his thing. He would always curse. And then one day I sat, I sat down with him. I was like, listen, man, I'm just really uncomfortable with the way you talk. And he was kind of offended by that. And so what he said was, you know what? I'm going to try to change. And so he got a swear jar. And he put like a quarter in it or something every time he cursed. So whenever he cursed, I would say, hey, man, that's a quarter. And, so he's, and he put a quarter in this jar. But I got to tell you, he never stopped cursing. Nothing ever stopped changing. If, you, if you're talking about finances, I know certain people who have a real hard time with shopping and they spend too much money beyond their means, and then you take a credit card away from them, they say, you know what, I'm going to put a credit card away. I'm done with this credit card. And then they go and they get another credit card. <laughs> Doesn't really help the situation. And then I've seen people who have a lust problem or, or an issue with, with, with the thought life, and they say, you know what, I'm going to stay away from certain things. I'm going to stay away from certain places, the computer, all kinds of stuff like that. I'm going to stay away from all that. But then guess what? They find another way. And the reason because of that is because they're just addressing the river and they're not addressing the heart. And what I'm trying to explain to you, my brothers and sisters, is that if you are content with just addressing the, the river, 
you'll never solve the problem. It will always be the same. That's my word, I swear, I promise. And I know it because I lived it. And I'm sure we have all lived it, amen? If you go into this river, and if the heart is polluted, and you go into this river and you take out a piece of trash, I guarantee you within a couple days you're going to see that trash again. If you go in there and you try your best to take out a whole bunch of junk out of that river, come a couple days, couple weeks, couple months, you're going to find that trash again. It's always going to be the same. And the only way to fix it is to change the heart itself. And Christianity, Christ, is the only religion and the only way where God says, as in Ezekiel 36 verse, uh, 36, verse 26 to 28, God says, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove that heart of stone. Christianity is the only religion in which he says, I will give you a new heart. The heart that you have is not going to work. The heart that you have has been failing you. I will give you a new heart. Amen? Does that make sense? Now, when I was younger, my dad, who's a pastor, he would show me these different videos, and some of them would kind of freak me out. <laughs> he showed me this video in the Middle East, I think, um, where these people would go through the streets and beat themselves with these chains and beat themselves and beat themselves and beat themselves with these chains across their back, and they would wear white shirts so that you could see the blood. And the reason they did this was for the atonement of sin. And I remember my dad looked at me and he said, don't, aren't you happy you don't have to do that? <laughs> Jesus did that for you. You don't have to go through any of that stuff. You don't have to always feel as though I'm a failure. I have to do something about this sin. I have to do something about this river. I have to do something about this river because it's always bad. You don't have to do anything like that because Jesus Christ is different in the whole, the whole game. Because what he does is he gives you a new heart. And what does a new heart look like? What does a new heart look like? I'll, I'll give you a few examples of what a new heart looks like. A new heart looks like a fisherman who is a nothing and a nobody going and preaching the gospel to 3,000 people. That's what a new heart looks like. A new heart looks like a person who is tormenting and torturing Christians and killing them to becoming one of the greatest Christians and writers and apostles of all time in Paul. Amen? A new heart looks like that. A new heart is a drastic change. It's a drastic difference. So my question to you, my brothers and sisters, is as you came into this place today, can you confidently say that I have a new heart? Can you confidently say that my heart is different than when before I met Jesus? Is that river in your life, are your actions and the things that you do so drastically different than they were before you met Christ? Because if they are not, then I ask you, my brothers and sisters, do you truly have a new heart this morning? Is your heart really new? Or are we just playing the game? Are we just running with the crowd and just doing what everybody else is doing and just going through the motions and coming to this place and singing these songs and doing these things? If your heart isn't changed, it doesn't matter. If your heart isn't changed, it doesn't matter. And this one scripture that a lot of people like to, like to bring to my attention is, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When I was little, when I was young, I told my dad, my dad's a pastor, I, I went up to my dad and I thought I was so smart. I, I thought I was this real smart guy and I had this scripture and I wrote it down and I said, well this is probably predating a lot of you guys, but I said, I want a Super Nintendo. <laughs> because, because he'll give me the desires of my heart and that's what I want. And, and my dad was like, you really don't get it. 
And so I came back and I was like, oh man, maybe that's just a wrong thing to ask for. So I wrote down, I want a puppy. Give it to me, man. Give it to me. The Bible said I should get it because it's the desire of my heart. And I'm telling you, I really want it, so... What I have to tell you, my brothers and sisters, is that when you delight yourself in the Lord, when God gives you a new heart, what you desire will be what God desires. Sometimes we get so confused. We think that well, God's going to give us whatever we want, right? We gloss over the first part of that scripture and we go to the second part. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Forget about that first part. He'll give you the desires of your heart. I want it. Give it to me. But what we forget to really look at is delight yourself in the Lord. If you delight yourself in the Lord, you're only going to want what God gives you. That's all you're going to want. So if you're wanting other things, if you're going other places, doing other things, and you aren't delighting yourself and you're not finding joy in the Lord, then I question where that heart truly is. And what your heart is truly made of. There was a great, a great theologian and writer by the name of C.S. Lewis. I'm sure all of you have heard of that name. And he said that the problem in a lot of Christians' lives is that our passions aren't too strong. Our passions are too weak. Think about that. Our passions aren't too strong. Our passions are too weak. We get this new heart and we still feel these pullings from these different areas and different things and we start to let those passions for those things become greater than our passion for the Lord. How strong is your passion for God this morning? I had a friend of mine who told me this one quote and it stuck with me and it still sticks with me to this day. You will begin to look like whatever you revere you will begin to look like whatever you revere. What is sitting on the throne of your heart? What is sitting on the throne of your heart? Because whatever you look up to, whatever you revere is what you're going to start to look like. If what you revere is just becoming popular and becoming famous and, and all those things, you might just be that. You might work hard and you might just be that. But if what you revere is to be like Christ. If sitting on the throne of your heart is Jesus Christ, if what you delight in is Christ, and the desires of your heart are Christ, then you, my brothers and sisters, will begin to look like Christ. You will begin to look like Christ. That's my word for you today, this morning. I know it wasn't a long word, it wasn't a jumping up and down kind of crazy message, but it's a word that is very applicable to us today because the funny thing about the heart is that nobody can see it nobody can see it I cannot see your heart the pastor here this awesome awesome man of God cannot see your heart which means a lot of people can go through the motions and you would never know it ever but what does that one song say He's looking into your heart. There's one person, one being, who can see your heart. You are completely exposed before him. And my brothers and sisters, I ask you this morning, finally, what does your heart look like before God? Who sits on the throne of your heart? Because whoever sits there is what you are going to look like, either for your benefit or for your destruction.